Brittany covered everything that I was going to say in her <laughs> prayer. Uh, so would you stand for the benediction? No, don't do that. That's wishful thinking on your part. Brittany, we're going to miss you, dear. We Thank really are. Hey, will you bow with me for just a moment of prayer? Our gracious and loving God, now may the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you. O oh Lord, our strength and our everlasting redeemer. Amen. A little over a year ago, I, uh, I'm sorry, a little over a week ago, I went to see my ophthalmologist for my annual checkup. And each year I go to see him, and each year we go through the same routine. First, his assistant checks my vision. He uh, puts that paddle over one eye, and then he puts the paddle over the other eye, and he asks me to read the chart on the door. And I always get as far as the E, and, and you know, so I get that far. And then he takes these set of, uh, of lenses that look like they've come from outer space, and he puts them on my eyes, and he asks that question that anyone who's ever had corrective lenses has heard before. You remember what it is? Which is clear? One or two? One or two? And sometimes he'll get to three or four. And then comes the fun part. Then he takes and, and he puts in my eyes those drops that will dilate my eyes. And, and they not only sting a little bit, but with kind of an ironic twist, they have a way of destroying your vision for about the next five hours. And then the doctor will come in. And he'll begin to check my eyes for glaucoma and for cataracts and for other diseases that might be harmful to my eyes. And now all of this is done, of course, to address any concerns that might exist and to help my vision, my vision, be as healthy as possible. Well, as you have no doubt discovered as you've looked at your bulletin, this morning is Vision Sunday. It's an opportunity for us as a congregation to do an annual checkup and see how we're doing with our vision. And frankly, I can't think of a better Sunday for us to be doing this than this morning because in the church, the Sunday before Lent is always known as Transfiguration Sunday. And it recalls that scene that you heard read in the scripture lesson a few minutes ago where Jesus took Peter and James and John and he went up onto a high mountain and there he was transfigured or transformed before them, which really means that they began to see Jesus for the first time for the person he really is. They saw him not just as a man, but they began to see him in all of his power and in all of his majesty and in all of his glory. Now, the Bible speaks a lot about the difference that vision can make in our lives. Near the end of the book of Proverbs, which is a book that is full of these little nuggets of wisdom, the writer says, where there is no vision, the people perish. In the Old Testament, we read how the Israelites captured a vision of the promised land, and that vision carried them for 40 years through the wilderness through all sorts of ups and downs until eventually they reach the promised land. And in the New Testament, we read how the disciples captured a vision of the kingdom of God on earth and they literally turned the world upside down. So, where are we here at Dunwoody United Methodist Church with our vision? And many of you may recall a couple of years ago, just about this time, when I stood before you and I shared with you the vision that we had adopted as a congregation. You remember it? If you remember it, say it with me. To be a dynamic Christian community of fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> to be a dynamic Christian community of fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And immediately after we adopted that vision, we adopted a five-year strategic plan that we believed would help advance us towards the realization of that vision. Now, we're halfway through the second year of this five-year strategic plan, and we have many things to celebrate. If you happen to be a number cruncher, you will be happy to know that all of the traditional markers that are used to, to determine the health of a church remain very strong here at Dunwoody United Methodist Church. Once again, last year, our membership grew by 72 people, and some of you were in the worship services 
when uh, we reached the 5,000 member mark. It, it happened during the confirmation of our confirmation class. And, and at the end of 2017, our corrected membership role stands at 5,013 people. Our average attendance in Sunday school has also increased this last year. It went up from the previous year. The previous year, it was 864 people. Last year, 2017, it was 877 people. And one of the areas that has, has had tremendous growth in this, this area has to do with our adult Sunday school attendance. When we went to the new Sunday morning schedule last August, our average attendance in adult Sunday school rose by about 100 people, or about 60%. Financially, we're very strong. We remain strong. Last year, we took in $300,000 more than the previous year, and that was good because our expenses also went up last year. And we, we ended up in the black by about $59,000. Our average worship attendance has continued to hover right around 1,200 people. Some years it's a little bit higher, some years it's a little bit lower, but for at least the last six years, it has hovered right there around the, the 1,200, mark, 1,200 attendance mark. Now, of course, as you know, these numbers do not tell the whole story. The real story is found in the lives of people who are touched and transformed by the missions and ministry of this church. Last year, Dunwoody United Methodist Church gave over a million dollars in the area of, of missions. During our food stock, we packaged, we hit a record, and we packaged, uh, as I recall, more than 305,000 meals to help feed the hungry. Our annual holiday festival also set a record last year and raised just shy, a net of just shy of $86,000, which will enable us to build our 28th house for Habitat for Humanity. You add to that the great day of service the mission trips that are taken by our youth and by our adults, the tremendous success that we've seen in our counseling center, our work with Action Ministries and all the rest. And it's obvious that there's a tremendous amount of ministry that's taking place here in this church. In terms of programming, you can drive onto the campus of this church on any given day or really almost any given night, and you're likely to find that the... Uh, the parking lot is just packed with people. Sometimes when I drive onto the parking lot, I wonder if I haven't, uh, if I haven't missed something that I forgot to attend, you know? We have all sorts of things. We have Bible studies and fellowship groups. We have support groups and leisure ministries. Parenthetically, did you know that we have approximately 3,000 participants every year in our leisure ministries program? We have children's ministries, youth ministries, young adult ministries, and interestingly enough, our young adult ministries is one of our fastest growing ministries here in the life of this church, and we have senior adult ministries. We have, as I have said on numerous occasions, we have a full service church here at Dunwoody. We began 2017 with three key initiatives. The first initiative had to do with communication. We knew that we had work to do in this area, and so as we stepped through the threshold of 2017, we began by analyzing where we were, where we needed to go, and the steps that needed to be taken to get us from where we are to where we needed to be. And on May 1st, Allison Fears came on to the senior staff of the church as the director of our communications program, and immediately we began making changes in the processes, you've seen the changes that we've made in the bulletins, and in what we communicate, and in how we go about communicating what we communicate. Now, we still have a lot more work to do in this area, but I hope you're already beginning to see some very positive differences in this area. The second key initiative that, that uh, we entered the year with, uh, 2017, 
had to do with our Sunday morning schedule, a reassessment of it. A task force was formed, and they began meeting monthly, and, and then they took their recommendations to the committee of 100 who reflected on it, and then they came back and met again, and then they made a recommendation to the church council. And as you know, last August, we started the new Sunday morning schedule. Now, we did this for several reasons. We did it in part because you as a congregation asked for it. It wasn't something that we just thought up on our own. You as a congregation asked for it. We did it in order to help enhance our traditional services and in order to make it possible for those of you who were attending Sunday school during the same hour that contemporary worship was going on could still go to Sunday school and, and choose to attend the worship service of your choice. We did it to help make, the, make it possible for the clergy to be more involved in Sunday school and to help unify this church. Now, I know that not everybody was in favor of this change. I have received your emails. <laughs> but I'm also happy to report that this new Sunday morning schedule has gone a long way, I believe and others believe, toward helping us to achieve every single one of the goals that we set out to accomplish. The third key initiative had to do with the enhancement of our worship services. And, and although specific modifications have been made in each one of the services, the real way that this was found, or the primary way that this found expression, was through our sanctuary renovation program. As most of you know, January a year ago, the church council voted to uh, form a, a uh, building committee. And in the space of one year, the building committee can presented a conceptual plans. A capital campaign committee was formed. The capital campaign committee uh, went out and conducted a $5.6 million campaign. They had more than $6 million committed to the campaign. And last November, a charge conference approved the final plans for the renovation of our sanctuary. On May the 14th, the morning prayer and communion service and the traditional service will be moving out of the sanctuary and uh, the construction will begin. The morning prayer and communion service will be going into our newly renovated chapel. And the traditional service will be coming down the hall and will be sharing space here in this contemporary service with you. And after several months of being in here, then, and we hope it'll be about four months, then we're going to be moving this service and the traditional service will be moving uh, back into our newly renovated sanctuary. And we believe that through all of these changes that, that we're making, that that is going to enhance every single one of our services. So what's ahead for Dunwoody United Methodist Church? Well, there are several things on the immediate horizon. First of all, just as a follow-up to what I've just been talking about, we are working right now very hard on getting ready for leaving the sanctuary. And there is still a lot that has to be worked out. But among other things, what, what that will involve, and this will be of interest to those of you who have children, is our children's program on Sunday mornings will be moving from the fellowship hall here into the gym. We're going to be asking some of our adult Sunday school classes to consider temporarily combining with other Sunday school classes during the summer months and as a staff we're working to figure out places where the staff can be uh, because of the disruption that's going to be in the administrative area as a result of all of this now I know that this is a disruption for all of us but I do believe that if we will all face it with a good spirit a sense of humor and a sense of patience then we can actually have some fun with this. And in about 10 years, we can look back on it with some fondness, you know? <laughs> uh, another of the uh, 
things that has been on the forefront of our minds uh, has to do with our children's ministries and our youth ministries. This church has a long history of excellence in both of these areas. And last spring, the bishop and the cabinet surprised us a bit when they took the two people that we had intended to lead these two areas and appointed them to other churches. Now, I've been on the cabinet before, and I know they had good reasons for doing what they did. But that still raised some unexpected challenges for us as a congregation. Since that time, we've realigned some of our senior staff responsibilities, and Jenna Kennedy is overseeing uh, our children's ministries, and, and I see Megan sitting over here, and, and, and Jenna, along with Megan and others on the children's ministry staff, have already begun working, and we're beginning to move in some very positive directions in our children's ministries. Regarding our youth ministries, Karen Bass assumed responsibility for our youth ministries in the summer and, and on into the fall. Karen has since taken a position with another church uh, over in Norcross, and we are grateful to her for her many, many years of service at this church. Many of your young people had their lives touched and transformed by Karen, and so we are grateful for her, and we wish her well. Since that time, or currently, we are working with a firm on a national search for a youth minister here at this church. Already, that firm has identified and looked at 25 different candidates, and we have already interviewed one candidate. And we hope, according to an email I received yesterday, we hope to interview another two to five candidates sometime in the next few weeks. Again, I know that for many of you, particularly those of you uh, who are in the youth program or have children in the youth program. I know that these last few months have been frustrating for you. Frankly, they've been frustrating uh, for me as well. But I believe that we're headed in the right direction. And I believe that, uh, that we're going to get just the right person in there in the not too distant future. And along with the rest of our youth ministry staff, we're going to have a program that you're going to be very excited about. Well, when Jesus took Peter and James and John up onto the mountain, they got kind of a 30,000 foot view of things. And in a similar way, you've just gotten a 30,000 foot view of where we are, where we're headed uh, as a church. But what I really hope, what I really hope is that you see why all of this is important. I hope that you see that back behind it all are lives that are being touched and transformed for Jesus Christ. Right now, I think about the 97 people who in 2017 made a confession of their faith in Jesus Christ. Think of that for just a moment. 97 people, some, many of them youth, but some of them adults, made a confession of their faith in Jesus Christ because of the ministries of this church. Right now, I think of the look on the family that occupied the house that was built for Habitat for Humanity and, and the day when they occupied the house. That day, there was joy and laughter. There were tears streaming down the sides of their faces, and there was an inability to fully express their appreciation for what Christ, through this church, had done for them. Right now, I think of the little girl who ran up to me one Sunday morning, threw her arms around my legs, and then she looked up at me with a face that sparkled like sunshine, and she said, I love our church. Isn't that great? Right now, I think of the little lady who was forced to say goodbye to the man she had called her husband for decades. He had outrun her to the Father's throne. And as we talked, she said to me, I don't know what I'd have done without this church. And right now, I think of Melina Petrichone. And I always have trouble pronouncing that last name. So if I didn't pronounce it exactly right, I think I got it right. Melina Petrichone. Many of you know the Petrichone family. And you know that a few weeks ago, Melina was diagnosed with a brain tumor. 
and uh, many of you have been praying for her and, and the senior staff and uh, other staff in the church have, have been in constant contact with this family. And, and initially, the concerns were, was it cancerous? Because of its placement in the brain, would the removal of it affect her speech? Would it affect her memory? Would it affect movement in certain parts of her body? Well, I happened to be there shortly after the surgery was over. Melina hadn't really woken up yet. And I was in the room with her parents, uh, Joe and Tracy, and a couple of other people. And at one point, we gathered around the bed. I stood at the end of the bed, and we joined hands, and we started praying for her. And as we started praying for her, right in the middle of it, she woke up. And she said, I want a glass of water. Can you believe she did that to the prayer? <laughs> and when some, the prayer ended abruptly, by the way. And then someone went to get her a drink of water. And when they came back and put it up to her lips for her to drink, she reached out and took it with her own hand. Now, all of the signs are good. And as Tracy said to me after all of this, she said, you know, there just couldn't have been a better answer to that prayer, could there? As I left the hospital that day, I was moved to the point of tears. This was last Thursday. And I was so grateful to be a part of a church that is willing to walk with people through tough times like this, and they don't always end this positively. And hers is not over, but you know what I'm saying. I'm grateful to be a part of a church that cares about the ministries to help people grow in their faith in Jesus Christ and to introduce others to Jesus Christ. And I'm grateful for a church that dares to have a vision to be a dynamic Christian community of fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. May God grant that one day we will fully reach that vision. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.